Good morning. <laughs> Welcome and uh, just come on in, get yourselves comfortable. We have a big plan for today. We've got one chair for those of you who like to rock. <laughs> <laughs> that is an old reference. Oh no. Put in the chat if you know what that reference is. A rocking chair? Oh my god, you're too young to know the reference. <laughs> yeah, there's a big age difference between us. It's shocking. No. What you're is wrong. It? Oh, now I know. Is that is that the friendly giant? Yes. Yes. Come on. Okay. It's a kid's show. I was too young. Um, but anyway. Okay. Welcome. We've got more people in the room now. We'll get started in just another minute. Try your very... Oh, I'm not even going to say try to come on time. Of course you're trying to come on time. <laughs> oh, thanks, Dr. Oh, Jacobs. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about tautologies placed in the order in the form of an order. Tau, tau. Tau, tau. Yeah, okay. Libellule. Libellule. I see a libellule. Oh, see there's, long. there's, yeah, wonderful. A dragonfly. How pretty. Oh, oh it's going backwards. away. What? Backwards in oh, time. Oh, it's not a papillon. If it is, it's got like a long, it's a papillon de nuit. It's a oh, long it's tongue. A moth. Oh, this one? Yeah. Or is it a No, this is a flower. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday was Guy Lafleur's 70th birthday. My goodness. I don't know goodness. if there's any Montreal Canadiens fans, but as a uh, as a very old Montreal Canadiens fan, that was a big deal to me. Ah, okay, cool. Okay, we're almost at 400. Let's wait till we get to 400. Come on in! Oh, last week was Maori Language Week, and I think that's pretty cool. I agree. I nice. didn't know that. Amazing. I'm not sure if I've ever heard Maori spoken. Like, I don't know. Have you seen the, what's, some of you will know in the chat, but the uh, the chant that they do before yes. uh, before rugby matches. Yes. Okay. Amazing. Like, the, yeah. you can see the hair on my head stands up just <laughs> saying it. Yeah. Haka. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yes. We should do that before lecture. No. <laughs> <laughs> we we could do our own like 1070 dance. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> okay, cool. There's no encouraging words. No encouraging words. No. They're like just get on with the lecture. Okay. Oh, somebody saw a snapping turtle. Ooh, fun. Practice. Okay, welcome 425 of you in the room. Let's get started. So uh, I am going to, as always. Can I tell them one thing about this. snapping turtles as you save that? Yep. Uh, that snapping, if it was a big one, that snapping turtle could have been 60 or 70 years old. Uh, so ha it has seen a lot of practices. It has been here longer than Guelph the university has, potentially. Uh, beautiful. Yes. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Okay, so for today, um, we've got uh, some big words and concepts to kind of just like throw into your brain um, and, uh, and get you to start appreciating. This is gonna, this may be like brand new information to you. Um, we, uh, are going to be talking about different mechanisms of evolution. Uh, we're going to be talking about ultimate causes, proximate causes. It's going to be a lot and hopefully it will blow your minds. We're going to lift the hood and take a look and see what makes it work, Derry. What's down inside evolution? Oh, you've got a problem with your mutation rate. you got to get that fixed every once in a while. You need some immigration. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're going to go through that stuff. So some of it is going to be brand new. What we're not going to spend a ton of time on is the mechanism called natural selection because most people generally get the idea. We do want you to be able to explain the scale at which all of those different causes happen, and so we'll just make sure that, that we reinforce it with respect to natural selection. Oh, there's an update on the turtle. It was small. It was small. The turtle was small. Three inches, so it's little. So it's hopefully tiny. it's here yeah. by the time you retire. Wonderful. You, you remember what your parents or grandparents did if they retired? We won't be able to retire. That's all going to be used Oh, up. stop, stop, stop. Be no. optimistic. Okay, no. um, so that's what we're going to do today. But first... I'll just continue to update you about the status of the turtle. Okay. <laughs> but first, um, we gave you some homework with the villager larvae, and we hope that you were able to sort of compare and contrast the differences um, uh, between the two life cycles. And then we asked you to think about the advantages or the disadvantages. And they're really quite broad, right, from an ecological and evolutionary and a physiological perspective. Um, there are these these sort of facts or like things about them 
Um, and I think one of the things that's most important to realize, though, is that irrespective of the uh, advantages and disadvantages, these things exist. They are here, which means that it is still just good enough. And that's really one of the things that's important um, if you're studying evolution, is to understand that nature isn't really interested in optimization. Nope not interested in the best, simply in the just good enough. Just better than whatever's adjacent to you. That's right. So when something that's slightly better comes in, then there are big problems, right? I hope, I hope you understand and see where we're going with this, right? Okay, so now we had you thinking, we hope you had time to think a little bit about what all of this means and the implications because we've got a worksheet for you to Woo go to. So Smith is going to drop those links into the chat. Um, if you need an extra moment to go and access the chat, then please go ahead. It's on the course link site, Biology 1070 course, chat at the very top of the nav bar, class number four, and then you'll see the links there. Um, if you need to uh, find another page because all of them are occupied, then just go to another page and see if it is available. There's 100 students on it at a time. So once you have contributed, um, those, uh, those have, that have really already done their homework and are just copying down from one to the other, get off of it so that somebody else can come on. Um, and here is what they are going to look like. So we have Glaucidia on one side, Veliger on another side. We're asking for uh, advantages and disadvantages of these strategies. If you've got an A to L last name, it would be super great if you could start with the advantages. And if you have uh, an M to Z last name, if you could start with the disadvantages so that we can get a good spread of ideas. That and would be we amazing. We see you. We see you in there. There we go. So good. Okay. So um, here's what it looks like. We will update these and we will watch you. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, we're watching. <laughs> and we'll correct anything that we see um, that, uh, that should be sort of just nudged in a different direction. So That's right. We should just, instead of staring at the camera, to say we're looking at them, we're looking like just above the camera. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, come on in. If you're just joining us, jump onto the chat. Uh, and there's some links there. We're taking up the homework listening to or reading what uh, what you think and we'll we'll just stop talking for a few minutes yep. to give you some time and if you're just joining us you missed the fact that there were turtles at rowing practice this morning <laughs> and they were small and very cute so very young probably just hatched a little while ago Wonderful. other great turtle facts the sex <laughs> of those turtles would have depended on the temperature during a small window of time as they lay in their eggs under the ground stop saying interesting things <laughs> Let me go into administrative speak then. <laughs> yeah. Lots of stuff. Stuff to talk about. I'll go in and update. one updated by itself. Did it? Maybe. That seems weird. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe I was just on a different one. Yeah. Okay. Where are the links? Someone's asking. They are in this they chat. They are in the chat Look on course link. Look down. links all the way to the bottom. Look down. Or yaks. What was that from? Uh, it's yaks all the way down. <laughs> okay, let's take a look. Wonderful. You're doing great. Let me just read some stuff. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so this is fantastic. Thank you so much. So um, put up your right hand, pat yourself on the back. Well there's done. There's lots of good stuff in here. Yeah, there's some really, really good stuff. There's some stuff that we like a little more than other stuff. <laughs> so let's let's just kind of take a look and see and see what we've got. So starting with the Glaucidia. Um, the Glaucidia are just a reminder. Those are the ones that uh, parasitize a host fish, right? So they've got this <laughs> obligate, that's a good word, an obligate part of their life cycle to be at this, this parasite, right? Without the ability... Uh, to parasitize a fish, they do not survive, which makes it obligate, right? People have used the exact word. Amazing. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So good. Oh, you guys are awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. It so, relies on a hottie. Nope. Relies on a host. On a host. It relies on a hottie. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> okay. So relies heavily on a host population. That is uh, important, right? And what you want to do when you write those things out is ask yourself why. Play the why, why, why game, right? So why does it rely heavily on a host population? Or why is that a con in this particular case, right? Just And you can kind of flow chart your ideas out from there in order to connect them with some of the concepts that we're going to be talking about today, okay? Um, takes a lot of energy in attracting, I love that one, yes, there is a physiological trade-off, but how or why, right? What are we talking about specifically? Um, Glaucidia, they can bury themselves into the sediment, yes, and I'm not sure that that would be different than the Bellager larvae, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, rely on the host, rely on the host, cannot survive without the host, yes, the host. Very important. The use of host helps to spread population out. That is interesting. Yes. Good. Able to use fish for transportation to unreachable habit. Amazing. Yep. Guaranteed access to resources during develop. Woohoo! Tasty, bing, tasty bing, blood. Bing. Yeah, super. I love this. This That's is good. Great. I like the one underneath because that doesn't often come up that it's a safer yeah. environment yeah, yeah. within the gills of the fish. That's Predator awesome. free, right? Yeah. Super good. So let's go over here and take a look at some of these on the more independent, not directly reliant on outside influence for survival. That's that's good. Large populations are easy to achieve, which is hard to maintain. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's amazing. That's a lot well, of good that's there. a lot of good stuff. Yeah, easy prey for other organisms. Yes, um, super no good. No reliance on another species. That's good. Awesome. Free swimming can drift and spread much farther with the current. Very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the bath water. Really good. Yep, that's okay. And so, if you weren't able to come up with like one advantage and one disadvantage for each of these things, or two of these things, or whatever it is that we said. Now you can kind of go in and fill in based on, on what others have contributed. So super well done. Um, that's really, really good, tying it to these things. Um, great. What else do you see, do you want to talk about? We've got a couple more anything? slides, so I'll clear those circles here. Yeah, let's clear the circles because if you want a particular explanation for any of these, give me a, give me a stamp. Like, take a look. Here's another one. So we were working with four documents, right? Um, is there any one that you want us to like explain or like less likely to inbreed? That's interesting to me. Which I'm one? I'm not sure. So there's a pro for the Glaucidia, three up from the bottom on that screen. Less likely to inbreed. Less likely to inbreed. I like that you're thinking about that as a as an ultimately as a yeah, population and a yeah, genetic process. That's interesting. But I'm interested in your maybe you could throw them in the chats. If yeah, you like, throw your questions in the chat. Um, or your responses to our questions, because to okay. me that would seem, because you become stationary with your host population and you don't drift downstream and you can't move upstream, yeah. you might actually, comparatively, between the Glaucidia and the Velager, you might think that the Glaucidia might have a greater chance. I'm not sure if it's particularly large. Yeah, I, I think I see what they mean if, for example, they they uh, predate or parasitize two different fish that swim in different directions. But it's more likely that you would, with your sort of your siblings, parasitize the same fish. So I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure, but I do like that that word has been brought in. Yeah, because that's going to because it's going to be fun to think about. Yeah, yeah. potential uh, damage to the mantle. I see question marks there. That's of course the mantle is is the part of the muscle, the adult muscle body, that makes the lure, the lure that brings the fish in, so that they can 
yeah. release the Glaucidia into the gills. This is genius, actually, the potential damage to the mantle. Yeah. Um, so super well done, whoever wrote that in, because, it's yes. Genius. It's genius, especially if you make your mantle to look like the food of a big, scary fish, there is potential damage, right, um, in, in that interaction. So the closer you have your big, scary fish to your own body, the 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 increase the more likely it is to damage it right so yes requires more energy to produce the lure absolutely right sure. and there is this physiological and these are one of like there aren't i don't see as many physiological sort of pros and cons here but this is definitely one of them um because if if you're producing this this beautiful and elaborate lure something's got to give right um, your body's energy is is kind of like a bank account in that you have you know X number of dollars to spend. You can spend it on one thing, but that means that you can't spend it on another thing. So there are these trade offs um, that that you know have evolved. Now, it's obviously worth it um, because these things are around and they work well. I think that's an important uh, but part it's important to, to note that it, that they are here. We're not talking about the things in. So even if there are cons, the pros evolution would suggest, our observations in the field would suggest the pros outweigh the cons. Yeah. Maybe even if it's only just. Yeah. Super good. Now, there's a couple of observations in the chat. Um, what happens, what could happen, I presume, to the villager larva if the host fish gets eaten? Uh, they're, they're part of the food. So they, those, that energy, and that comes down to the fact that um, while the unionids won't produce as many larvae as the zebra mussels will um there's still a lot it's you're not talking like a like a here's my one precious black kitty larva you saw that release in the video the other day it's still like boom thousands yeah so what happens well if one of your fish gets eaten that's where lots of your black kitty go yep i also love this is a new introduction to here for the villager larvae susceptible to the environment yeah not just to to prey, right, or, or to predators, sorry, so susceptible to the predators, right, if you don't have, you know, a nice warm uh, gill tissue to nestle in and be protected by, not only are you um, exposed to predators, but you are also exposed to the environment, um, and that's, uh, yeah, fantastic, an excellent addition, really good, more exposed to the elements, there it is again, look at you, okay, well done. Really, really well done. Thank you so much for that. I hope it was helpful. I hope that this way of doing things is is helpful to you. Um, if it's totally just pissing you off, let us know. <laughs> we we had to abandon breakout rooms because I don't think it's working. Um, but anyway, oh here, uh, Lily wants to know high risk of fertilization not guaranteed. That's really interesting, and. Um, just remember, right, the glochidia as they are, um, uh, uh, yes, so the fertilization part happens in different ways, right? And all of that is complicated as well, right? Uh, what we're talking about are the larvae. So the larvae have already been fertilized, um, but certainly higher risk for the villager um, and certainly uh, harder. Yes. Okay. Some people think this is better than breakout rooms. Yay. Okay. Good. Cuz I kind of like I kind of like it cuz we're all like together t together. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Thank you. Are we good to move on? Are we all good to move on? Sure. Okay. Let's uh oh wait, one more thing. Olivia wants to know about more room for evolution. So, mm. Eh, mm. Not not really. So I so that's an interest. It's I think, interesting. I think there might be interesting things thinking about population size. Yeah. Potentially a very large population providing. Yeah. If I follow, if that's your reasoning, then thinking about more opportunity for mut mutations, random mutations to occur in a large population, maybe. Maybe. But. You can't a priori. A more, a more homogeneous environment, because you're being distributed just by ambient conditions, and so. The likelihood of, of small um, isolated populations and breaks in populations becomes less likely, so that's a, that's a that's a counterpoint to that argument. Yep. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. Let's move on. Oh, there we go. Okay. So thinking about all of that, we're gonna throw a challenging question at you. Holster. You've not seen this before. Yep. Holster your. We'll give you a few minutes. Take your time. 
Please no stamping on the thing. Yeah, holster your pens. Holster your pens. Yeah. I see what you're saying. <laughs> I have the Muppets in my head. Oh no. Yep. Not the focus. No, that's just where my head is. That's great. 65% of you have already clicked in. Amazing. You can't live with them. You can't live without them. Something irresistible that we wish about them. We jumped on fish skills in my pond. Well done. No cool kitia is the best thing that came along. What is that? That's amazing. <laughs> you look surprised. I'm surprised. <laughs> like, <laughs> Something amazing came out of your face. <laughs> I know. I can't see the pole anymore. Did we close it? No, it should be there. Never mind, solved. Solved. Okay, good. Yay. Okay, super good. So remember, these are not, these are not marked right this yeah. is an opportunity for you to see the kinds of questions that we might ask in a we are planting a flags in your brain test and quiz that kind of thing do not panic <laughs> it's all good and you're doing very well uh okay we'll just give it another few more seconds so get your uh get your answers in please wonderful in five, not for four, three. Oh wait. Well, one thing I will say though, um, for those of you that have have not, <laughs> you never worked at NASA. Uh, here we go. Rockets are launched. Five, four. <laughs> Actually, Actually, one more thing before you guys go to the moon. <laughs> I have worked at NASA. I know. <laughs> okay. But they didn't let you do a countdown. Yeah. No, I didn't that. get to do a countdown. No. Okay. So uh, one thing I will say for those of you that are not clicking in, um, if, if you can't, like you're unable to for some reason, that's totally good. That's totally fine. And if you're just holding off to see the answer, just just click on something. Just commit to something so that we can plant that little flag in your brain. For God's yeah, sake, just cause... commit to something. <laughs> if you get it wrong, that's great. If you get it right, that's actually not nearly as good for learning. So get it wrong. Commit to it, and then it'll be like, oh, yeah, now I get it. Come on, you and then you'll Ted never Lasso forget it. it. Ted Lasso it. Get Ted out Lasso there and it. lose. Then lose. goldfish around. Yes, it's so important to do that now when there's no risk associated with it with respect to grades or anything like that. Okay? Good. Thank you. Now we're up to 90. <laughs> Convinced. Okay, ready? I'm going to end the poll. And I'm going to share the results with you. So there is a bit of a disagreement between two, primarily. Um, and those are the right two. I mean, even if you're unsure, they are the opposite. And so one of them has to be false and the other one has to be true, right? Um, and most of you that selected between those two got the correct answer. So well done, you. I think these observations need a visual assist yeah of the two and the one and of the, the two and the one yeah. <laughs> okay so well uh well done so the answer is c 
Um, and uh, therefore, the answer E is uh, an untrue statement. And the reason, uh, and you can play this video later and kind of walk through it, um, the reason why the answer is C is that in order for populations to speciate, that is, to evolve into a totally different species, the thing that has to happen is there has to be some kind of barrier. They can't be able to immigrate and emigrate or move from one population to another and reproduce. There has to be a separation, some kind of subdivision of a population in order for speciation to happen. This may be brand new information to you, so please, we have these questions here so that you work through later um, because what you want to do with this question is not only just go, oh yeah, okay, the answer is C. We want you to write out why the answer is not A, B, D, and E. What are the mechanisms? What are the vocabulary that, that are relevant to explaining these things? And now we're going to give you the vocabulary to be able to do that. So there's that. a question about the word speciate. What is that? Ooh, yeah. speciate means that it evolves, the population evolves into a new species. Something... So one species becomes a new one. Totally different. So it's a, we sometimes think of it as a point in time, but it's clearly a process. And we're often looking backwards at that point. And so from a distance, just like from a distance in a field, you can look at a point on the horizon and realize that's a long road, but it seems like a point from a long way away. Yeah. So we point backwards in time and go, well, there used to be two snuffle-footed varmigators, um, and now they got separated by a big giant mountain range, and now there seems to be more than there were before. We'll talk about some of these processes. We'll talk about it. We will try to tell you what a species is, and you will watch us like kind of short circuit as we try to explain it. Um, it's all very cool. Good. Oh, I don't believe this is being recorded. Yes, it is being, should be. Yes. Yeah, yeah. it is being recorded. Thank yeah. you though. Always ask, always yeah. nudge us. Okay. Stop sharing. Moving on. Now you can kind of sit back and relax <laughs> just for a little bit. Now everybody's demanding a tangent. Tell us about NASA. No, we'll tell you about that later. But um, here, genetic variation. Smith, you're up. So when we're talking about the processes of speciation or the process, oh, no, tricky. Yeah. you want to do it, yeah. you do it. So we have um, numerous ways that you can achieve genetic variation. So heritable variation that's not just occurring in one generation, but is going to be passed on to the next upon which the environment can act. So we see genetic variation. We talk about differences at the level of DNA within a population, inside of a species, or within a species. And we can have different, just as there's, um, if you look at a comb, remember I look at a comb and I, I imagine a theoretical comb. Some of you might actually have a comb. But on that comb there's uh, thick, I'm told, thicker teeth and then thinner teeth, smaller teeth. Think about genetic variation in the same kind of way. There's some variation that occurs very finely within a population, and there's some more variation that occurs at a more thick level, at a species level, or even at a above the species level. Pretty good. Well, well done. So alleles, when we use the word allele, we're talking about different versions of the same gene. And the gene being the region of DNA that codes for a particular uh, that builds a particular thing. Genetic variation and how it can change uh, is really the study of evolution and so there's some principally some large ways that there can be the most uh, elemental one is change at the level random changes that occur in the DNA via errors in copying so mutation. Um, there can be evolution via natural selection. We've talked about that before, and we've even said that you're probably all very familiar with it, so we're not going to talk about it a lot, but differential survival of some of those possessors of random mutations that um, survive more that, so than the others. Genetic drift and gene flow, we will talk about with some examples. These might be two of the new terms for you. But remember that the primary source of genetic variation is mutation. It can also come from a combination, but uh, mutation is the thing. If there is not mutation, there is not variation. So just as we've talked about with learning, learning comes from errors, evolution comes from errors. Errors are an, you, you can't go through this life and not make errors and expect to get anywhere. You gotta fall down. 
Mutations uh, are, as I just said, errors in DNA replication. And this is an important point. And think about it as you learn, use language. As Dr. Jacob said earlier, we want to be precise. And so we never, we try and avoid terms where we talk about um, directionality or intent. So we'd never use a sentence where the muscles um, mutated in order to. It's like, no. no. That might have happened, the two, the thing that you've observed, and the muscles may have mutated that allowed it, but that mutation was not to cause that thing. The mutation was a random event. Yeah, super important. So that's an ultimate cause, right? Um, so Smith said primary cause, mutations are these ultimate causes of variation, okay? And so they can happen in different ways at different levels. Uh, that's right. I see it. I'm looking at the chat also okay. and looking at, uh, so there's people talking about eye color. Yes, and I would imagine in some of your classes we've talked, you've talked about kind of uh, changes in alleles and, and how eye color is inherited. Um, and I see the word allopatric. So people nice. thinking about methods of speciation having to do with genetically or geographically becoming isolated. Yeah, we'll talk about that for sure next time. -ish. So you've, you'll have this slide in a matter of minutes, yeah. but basically just a quick review that when we're talking about mutations, so these random changes, this ultimate cause, there are four different kind of ones. The primary um, mutation, point mutations, chromosomal mutations, duplications of the gene, and genome, entire genome duplications. The difference in the last two is a matter of scale. Genes are kind of one section, one little address. One, If you think about the genome being like the map of you, the map of the city, uh, so, so your genome is your map of you, it's all of the genes that make up you, um, and coding and non-coding regions, the whole complex map, the gene is just an address or a street within it. And so you can analyze and you'll see in your generation of, of biologists, you're going to have to become good at reading studies to understand if they're a genomic analysis, have they analyzed the whole city, or a genetic analysis, have they analyzed the street. So the causes there, chance errors for point mutations, um, breaks in DNA caused by radiation and other factors, particularly early on in evolutionary or in the history of our Earth, uh, when we didn't have as much protective ozone, when there was more kind of mutagenic radiation, wavelengths of radiation reaching the Earth's surface, we think that was a really important way that, that, um, that mutations were um, occurred. And then gene duplications, uh, you remember meiosis and mitosis, well, gene duplications if, occur if there's unequal crossing over during meiosis, and gen genome duplications can happen when there's hybridization. Now that might set some of your ears or your fine hair on top of your head tingling because you think, wait, if they're hybridizing, aren't they the same species? How can they be different if they're hybridizing? And we'll come to that when we talk about what a species is and how permissive that definition has to be. Amazing. Let's do the rest of it just by reading later on. Yeah, good. Cool. So natural selection. We said we wouldn't talk about it, but now we'll talk about it very shortly, very briefly. <laughs> So, so we have our ultimate causes of genetic variation, right? So under all of that, um, uh, then a whole bunch of things. Once you have that variation, a bunch of things can happen, okay? Some of them can be random and some of them can be non-random with respect to the consequence of that variation. Sometimes variation has no consequence. That's cool. Nothing happens after. <laughs> Sometimes it has a consequence, right? If it's expressed as a phenotype in some way, right? If it, if it has some kind of difference that can be, uh, that can affect the individual. Sometimes it is non-random selection, right? Of that particular difference. So if that happens, if there's a non-random selection, it means that there is a change in the fitness of the individual that has those mutations, that has that trait expression in some way, okay? And if it means that they are just slightly better, slightly more fit, then you get natural selection. And it can happen at different scales, right? And I, I just want to throw in, I love the fact that functionally we're talking about kind of reiterating to you that this is a random process 
and a non-random process, that the non-random process builds on the random process. Yeah. So that's that might be something to, uh, to think about as you study and you, with your groups of friends, as you try and make questions like the ones that we just made, as you try and duplicate that, which is a great way to study. Mm -hmm. um, think about trying to change some of those definitions that, that make you hone in on the fact that one of these is random and one of them is non-random. That's right. So it starts out random, mutations, sometimes those mutations lead to something that is slightly better. And if it is, then there's the possibility of natural selection. It isn't even a guarantee because a whole bunch of random stuff can happen. And that's what we want to focus on. But let's just acknowledge that natural selection is there. It is non-random with respect to fitness. You're like the finches on the Galapagos. Island. I good. acknowledge that natural selection is here. <laughs> now I'm going to eat a tasty small seed. Yes. And it's cool and it's awesome and you know more about it than you know about the random stuff that we're going to talk about. Okay? So we're going to focus on the random stuff. The random stuff is called genetic drift. <laughs> Just kind of drifting out there, right? All of us I have eye colors that are, you know, virus. different. Some of us have brown eyes. Some of us have green eyes. Some of us have blue eyes. None of those make us more fit in this world for survival, <laughs> but yet we all have different colors and the proportions in our populations change over time for totally random reasons. I did not select my mate because of his eyes, right? But it was a good help. Well, wow, well, you have beautiful <laughs> eyes, but, but that's not going to increase his fitness, right? So these are random processes. They okay? came along for the ride. <laughs> that's right. Traits that come along for the ride that are not selected for evolve due to random genetic drift, okay? Hold on, because there are different ways that genetic drift can happen. So we were at the top, evolution, variation, over time, changing. We told you about mutations. Then we told you about non-random selection. Now we're over here at random selection. And now within random selection, we're going to tell you about a couple of examples that will hopefully kind of solidify this like big genetic drift idea. Okay. Hold on. Right. Now what I have to do is I have to slide over a oh, different... Oh, did you see what you just did? Your pun? What did slide I slide over? I slide over. And it's a slide. It's a sl Oh my goodness, I'm funny. <laughs> okay. Yes. So funny. <laughs> I'm funny. Okay. Here we go. This is a PowerPoint where the animation I think works. We're gonna find Wait, out in a second. This is inception style. This yeah, is Google this PowerPoint is a slide on top with a slide. of slide. Can you um, see it though? Can um, you see my underneath PowerPoint? Underneath is gonna be like a slate with a yeah, chalkboard. Yeah. Great. Okay. Hold on. Uh, and this is being recording recorded, so you will be able to get this um, on uh, the video afterwards if you want to follow along. But let me just show you um, generally what. Uh, genetic drift is. And so we have a population of spiders, six legged spiders. That's so it's disturbing so to me. It's not a spider. <laughs> um, six legged spiders. Uh, some of them are blue in color, some of them are red in color. And of course, color is very not usually binary, but we're just kind of trying to explain this uh, using um, using sort of obvious differences. All of these spiders have differences in other traits as well. So there's a lot of genetic variation going on in the population. But if we just focus on the trait of color, red and blue, you can see that they are at 50%, red, 50% blue. And what genetic drift does for totally random reasons is over time, the population, the proportion changes, okay? So if we just randomly kind of select a group of spiders that are the ones that are going to be going off to reproduce in the future, what we end up with is a slow computer. Um, and say, let's just say randomly, these are the spiders that get to reproduce into the future. Um, and if we take a look now at the population proportions, you can see that it's changed from 44% to 56%. That's genetic drift. It is also evolution. It is not natural selection. Okay. Next. Genetic drift, there are many different sort of reasons, and again, the reason isn't random, like we know what the reason is. It, what's random is who gets to survive, who gets to live. It's not with respect to the fitness of that trait, okay? So that's what's random. 
So imagine we have our population. So what we're going to do is show you two extremes, right? One of the extremes is called the bottleneck effect. And the bottleneck effect is simply a change in the proportions of that trait, of that variation, due to a dramatic reduction of the population. So a whole bunch of individuals die, and just because they died, it removes that variation from the population. Okay, so it's a reduction in the population, and it looks like this. We have a big tornado that comes through our population of spiders. For random reasons, it takes out a whole bunch of them, okay? And when we reassess the proportion of uh, color variation, we see that it has changed from 50-50 to 42-58, okay? And that would be like a big change if that happened within a population. And the other extreme example, which is different, is called the founder effect. And the founder effect is simply the sort of butting off of some individuals from a big population to start another smaller population. That's why it's called founder. They're founding their own population. And so imagine we had a mainland population of spiders and an island that wasn't too far away that they could get to. We start out with 50-50, and then over time, a subpopulation colonizes that island and takes over. And just because of random reasons for why those individuals made it over to the island, you now have a rather dramatic change in the variation. So that's the founder effect. And there are consequences and implications for all of these things. The next concept that we want to introduce is actually kind of the opposite. It's, it's called gene flow. And gene flow, if you think about the word gene, obviously there's something genetic going on there. And flow means it's kind of flowing back and forth. And if you want to kind of anchor these in concepts that you're probably familiar with, think about immigration and emigration across populations. So gene flow is the kind of swapping of genes <laughs> across two or more populations. It means that individuals are immigrating and emigrating and leaving their genetic variation there, which means they're reproducing um, in those different populations. And it looks like this. So exchanging alleles think movement. Movement, yes, okay. It looks like this, we have two populations. Right? So we're already established that there are two populations. The island population is entirely red for now. But with gene flow, the movement of individuals across. Is gene flow like gene smart? <laughs> we should acknowledge gene smart. She's amazing. Just an amazing if you're not person. watching Hacks. Yeah, watch it. Or Mary Easttown, watch it. <laughs> um, wonderful. OK, so over time. Uh, we have these sort of swapping of genes because of reproduction going on, and we have a change in the proportion of this trait. It's not because that trait is more fit. It's not because the red ones have more babies. Simply random processes with respect to fitness. You missed the boat. You didn't miss the boat. That's right. And if you're thinking, what if those spiders were able to swim over to the island and some of those spiders weren't able to swim over to those islands and therefore they are more fit, then what process are we talking about? It sounds, it sounds non-random. It sounds non-random, which means that we're talking about natural selection. So it all depends on the context, right? We can change up this scenario to make it about natural selection if you want. Natural selection is... Yep. Well done. Right? Yeah, There's good. There's also people that don't want me to talk about Gene Smart. They want me to talk about Gene Simmons. And oh. I think Gene Simmons is a much less palatable person than Gene <laughs> Smart. But that's... That's just your opinion. That's just my Wonderful. opinion. Others are available. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So this is this is a lot, I am sure, and that is fine. And we're recording this, so you can watch it again. Um, and uh, <laughs> woo -hoo! and we've given you homework that is exactly meant.
to help you kind of put it all in your brain, understand the differences between these terms. We don't want you to memorize these terms. No. We want you to be able to explain the differences. So we have a homework thing. It's cool. Before you move on. Yeah. There's some people that have been commenting on the the stoppy nature of the, of the animation that they're yeah. seeing. In the recording, uh, it'll be slightly smoother. So you can yeah. come back. You don't have to spend the whole hour in the recording, but uh, come back to the YouTube and come in around whatever minute we are yeah. and uh, and watch it a little bit more. You'll see it. It'll be smooth. It has to do with our connections, right, and all of that. So we've got it recorded. And when with the lecture, okay. lectures are always posted, kind of, I try and get them posted later the same day. Yeah. Okay, so let's move uh, here. Hold on. This is the awkward one in Google Slides. Google Slides didn't like to... Um, didn't like it all that much, so I'm just going to skip through the Google Slides, and we're going to throw a question at you. So let me do that while Oof. I go back to the other slides. Well done. Half of you already in. That's great. You're doing very well. Tablets. Uh, yeah, those of you who are having trouble seeing the poll, are you on a tablet? Got four hundred and five responses, so those people can see the poll. Yeah. And I'm just wondering what the difference Maybe is. Maybe some other tablet people have some yeah. suggestions. You can you can usually with tablets, even like the annotate features, you have to kind of hover or find like a little icon thing on the side on a mac it usually pops up oh my goodness yeah it's a mac it's, it's a, a mac, mac no i don't know yeah okay hmm. so if you can't see the poll you hopefully you can see the slide it doesn't you don't need to click in you just in your brain need to commit to an answer yeah that's the, that's important, the important part thing. so you can see the question yes so. just commit yeah we'll always have a slide like this and then we'll also have it duplicated on the poll. So um, even if you can't click in for us, and we're at 90%. Which are the following explanations? Great. OK, so I'm going to end the poll. And I'm going to throw the answers back at you. So to share the results, you've done uh, very well. The answer is um, the one about the great deal of movement. So the answer is C, um, because movement from across different populations of muscles kind of moving around that speaks to gene flow um, and that certainly uh, would um, or could increase the genetic variation uh, across the different populations and so it would lead to more variation it doesn't lead to less it could lead to no change but it's not going to lead to less variation that's for sure um, so well done 
And then the other ones, uh, you can kind of work through as you learn more and more about these different um, mechanisms and what the implications are, okay? Um, and we've got some homework for you in the last minute. We'll just go through very quickly what the homework is. So here is a big table um, with all of the different vocabulary that we brought into the conversation today, all of the different mechanisms, and we're asking you to fill it out as best you can. Sometimes there is no answer, but trying to answer it is going to help you understand the difference between them, okay? So our questions are, are these random or non-random processes? Does the genetic variation increase, decrease, or stay the same? You may have to write, it depends on blah, 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 and then tell us why. You've learned something. That's really good, okay? And does the resulting number of populations change? By definition of these terms, is there a change in the total number of populations at the end of the mechanism, at the end of the process, okay? Good. Hopefully that will be helpful. The other thing that you could do, you might want to start out, is by doing a bit of a concept map of all of the terms that we kind of threw at you. And so here, we kind of, if you want, you can print it off and cut them out. <laughs> um, or, <laughs> or you can do it um, on a jam board, or you can, however it is that you want to do this. It, for me anyway, it really helps if I can take all of these terms and create a bit of a flow chart. Um, evolution, get started with that one, is kind of at the top. Okay, um, and then from there you can divide up these different concepts and you'll see uh, that we've got gene flow twice. Um, and so you can kind of maybe think about Simmons why that smart. might be. Right, there are two gene flows, Simmons and Smart. So, um, so play with that. It, it may confuse you and then it may be like, oh, now I understand. Okay, so those are there for you as a, as a suggestion for how you might want to study and learn these terms. And we talked about the fact that it's, uh, it's a, what was it, Maori history or Maori music, uh, Maori language week last week. Today is Tatiana Masali's birthday. And if you've watched Orphan Black, you know that this product of Regina is uh, incredible. Yeah. And Orphan Black had to do with DNA. So happy birthday. Yay. <laughs> and with that... We will uh, say thank you and goodbye. And if you want to stick around for questions and discussion, so long, we farewell. will come back in just a few more minutes. We're going to turn off and then stay here. Adieu. Adieu.